You know, John, I've been thinking a lot about what's going on, and I think I have some correlation to some of the things that we deal with as caregivers that may apply to what's going on around the country. This is Hope for the Caregiver. This is Peter Rosenberger. This is the nation's number one show for you as a family caregiver. If you want to be a part of the show, 877-655-6755, 877-655-6755. We'd love to have you be a part of the show. John, I've been thinking about this. John, uh, the Count of Mighty Disco himself is with us. I am, I am. Uh, you know, I was watching, like most people are, just the, the meltdown of the country kind of thing. You know, we're almost like having a national seizure. Yeah. And 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 it's just it's heartbreaking to see on on multiple levels and i don't think that it's you know that i can add anything to the equation of the political commentary and so forth but when yeah, i set there, out to there write are other my, more qualified people that yeah they're, they're, thank you for affirming that john <laughs> oh um, no it's, I, it's I, always I, great it's yeah. it's you know it's that it's that right there to lift me up moment that that makes you so special to me i'm yeah. just here to uh, you know i'm not i'm not really here to take you by the hand it's really more to grab you by the ankle you know <laughs> by the hair um, <laughs> no i when i set out to write my book Hope for the caregiver, and I was uh, when the publisher asked me to get involved with this book. They wanted to do this. They said, "Look, we'd like for you to do this." And yada yada yada. And it was one of those things. It, it was a book deal that happened in a space of hours. Mm. You know, I didn't have to pitch or anything else. They came to me. That's always the best kind of book deal. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I imagine and, it is. <laughs> so, and I started doing this. I, I looked. At, okay, what what are the core issues that caregivers deal with? What, what are we faced with? I mean, because I think when you first think of caregiving, and, and this is what it's been ever since I've even talked about this show, from pitching the show when, before we even started, was they thought about nursing homes. Right. And that's that, that's just kind of general thought. And I thought, no, caregiving is so much more than just dealing with a nursing home. And caregivers deal with very, very significant realities that are common to all mankind, but enhanced because of the pressure cooker. Exactly. Yeah. Being okay. a caregiver just makes all of the things that we all deal with way more intense. It's like a martial amp. Oh, if, if nice. I may. Yes, you may. <laughs> uh, if I may. <laughs> so it's it's like a martial amp. It just it just truly cranks up the noise. Okay. So then I thought I started re, you know reverse engineering. All right. So what is the noise? That's being mm. cranked up so much. What is it about family caregivers that we're struggling so much to deal with? And I came up with this thing called the fog of caregivers, fear, obligation, and guilt. Because I feel like that is a common issue that human beings face, but it is uniquely difficult for caregivers because of the relentless onslaught. And it's so easy to get lost in that fear and that obligation and that guilt. How many times have we heard callers into this show, John, who just were doing things? There, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to face this? You know, all that fear that just generates and it generates yeah. that it ramps them up. Well, and, and what, because that's a that's a necessary mechanism that we have. We should be afraid of certain things, but we don't need to exist in that all the time. It's just we're not built for it. But as caregivers, we often do that. And you and we get forced into it, yeah. It's, yes, yeah. and and then you go to the obligation, you know, and that's when that resentment comes in. I'm obligated to this, and I, I need to be doing this, but I don't want to be doing this, and I'm obligated. And then we get into the guilt. Oh man, I shouldn't have done that, or you know, or I, I feel feel obligated. I, yeah, or I or I I brought this child in the world with special needs, or. I messed up or I wasn't there for mama every single day and the people at the nursing home abused her and I wasn't there. And then we yeah. feel guilty, all that kind of stuff. And then you get lost in this fog of caregivers. And what happens when you get lost? Well, then that's when, that's when accidents happen. That's when danger happens. That's when you hit a tree, you go off a cliff, you hit somebody else and you have to slow down and you have to dismantle this and go a different direction. This is what I did when I wrote the book. And I came up with a thing called, you know, the GPS to help caregivers navigate through it, something external of themselves to help them get through that. Well, how does that apply to the country? Excuse me, John. I'm sorry. That just no jumped up for you. There is no excuse. And I yeah. thought, are we as a country kind of lost in that fear, obligation, guilt, fog? And I thought about that because there was such um, unbridled destruction 
going on, and that often happens when people have lost their way and they don't know where they're going and they're just slamming into something. And and they think they're in control of something, but they're really not. And, you know, it's it the, 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 the fog doesn't respect anybody's abilities. It doesn't respect anything. It just it just right. is. It, it, yeah, it's it's just but something you, you have and to you, navigate. You either you either navigate it safely or you navigate it poorly. Your choice, and and so and, I, and as I watch these these individuals across the country doing this, I think some of them are being driven. Evidently, the reports bear out that some of them are being driven by ideology. I think we know that. Most people agree on that, some of that. But some of it is just being driven by people who are just in despair and lost and feel so disenfranchised, so so lost. I mean, it's no other word, it just really, lost. Yeah, yeah. And it, the, uh, it's, it, is, it, is, it is our, our job to you know, have empathy as humans. That's one of the things that we do. And being able to understand that from the perspective of a caregiver that can give a little bit of insight. So I well, like and so I this. thought about will the same things that help caregivers get out of that fog or navigate it safely work in this situation with that GPS, that grace, purpose, and stewardship. And I think we all, you know, with grace, and I'll get back to that. But uh, that word stewardship, when you hear the word stewardship, John, what does that signify to you? Um, well, the joke I want to make is, uh, <laughs> is from the shining, you know, <laughs> like, it's like, it's something a, really a steward, wrong a steward of the overlook hotel. No, but like if you're, a, you, uh, it is something that you, um, like a librarian, a librarian, custodian, is a, a, a custodian of all of this, you know, like they, it, like all of the books are in the custody of the librarian, but they are they are not owned by them it is not it is not they didn't write the books they didn't do anything like that they they keep them and make sure that they are in good condition for people to enjoy um because they feel that there is something valuable to put into the world by doing that um so when you say stewardship that's one of the first things that i think of well that's a very I'm, interesting thing that's very interesting. Um, oh, well, thank you. Stewardship is a word we don't use a lot. Um, our country's what twenty four trillion dollars in debt. Clearly, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> we don't use it a lot. But are we being good stewards of good custodians, if you will, to stay with that theme? Are we being good custodians of freedom? Mm. Are we being good stewards and custodians of other people's? Issues, weaknesses, or you know, things that they're facing. Are we yeah, being wh- good? Whatever their good, concerns are. Yeah. Yeah. Are we being good stewards and custodians of our own concerns? Oh. Are we just stuffing it down, and then it comes out in a destructive manner? Well, but that's what part- when we talk about boundaries. That's that's what because boundaries are not for other people; they are for ourselves. Uh, well, and I think that when when you don't deal with your own feelings of whatever they are in a healthy manner, they will come out in a destructive manner. I mean, it's just that 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 that's a given. It will happen. Yeah, you you yeah. either destructive towards someone else, or destructive towards yourself. I mean, that's what happens. Yeah. And and so I, I looked at we've all okay, been there. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> multiple times. But for me, well, but it's just, but but I look at what's going on in the country, and I'm thinking, okay. Are we being uh, are individuals or groups of individuals, uh, law enforcement, whatever, being good custodians, good stewards? And clearly, this all was triggered by uh, uh, this video of this law enforcement guy that you know, and he bought the ticket. He's going to take the ride, but but the the mission of the police force is to serve and to protect, not to command and to you know to beat down and uh if someone gets out of hand there are ways to do that but but then we've lost that story we can't even have that conversation anymore because of the destructive swath that went through the entire country the last four right. days well in in the same way that as a caregiver unfortunately meltdowns are a thing it there is some in there <laughs> yeah it, it like, got a closet is, full yeah. of t-shirts <laughs> <laughs> uh, and 
in in the middle of 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 a meltdown, what is it that caregivers need? And then if this country is in the middle of a meltdown, what is it that the country needs? Exactly. So can we draw can we use the same principles in dealing with a long term issue that doesn't show any signs of necessarily going away or being fixed? Can we deal with that with the same principles that caregivers deal with these things? And that's that's the question. That's the thought I have. And so I thought, well, let's talk about that a little bit today. About and you feel free to weigh in on that. 877-655-6755. 877-655-6755. This is Peter Rosenberger. This is Hope for the Caregiver. Healthy caregivers make better caregivers. We'll be right back. Have you ever struggled to trust God when lousy things happen to you? I'm Gracie Rosenberger, and in 1983, I experienced a horrific car accident leading to 80 surgeries and both legs amputated. I questioned why God allowed something so brutal to happen to me. But over time, my questions changed, and I discovered courage to trust God. That understanding, along with an appreciation for quality prosthetic limbs, led me to establish Standing with Hope. For more than a dozen years, we've been working with the government of Ghana and West Africa, equipping and training local workers to build and maintain quality prosthetic limbs for their own people. On a regular basis, we purchase and ship equipment and supplies. And with the help of inmates in a tenant prison, we also recycle parts from donated limbs. All of this is to point others to Christ, the source of my hope and strength. Please visit StandingWithHope.com to learn more and participate in lifting others up. That's StandingWithHope.com. I'm Gracie, and I am Standing With Hope. As a caregiver, think about all the legal documents you need. Power of attorney, a will, living wills, and so many more. Then think about such things as disputes about medical bills. What if, instead of shelling out hefty fees for a few days of legal help, you paid a monthly membership and got a law firm for life? Well, we're taking legal representation and making some revisions in the form of accessible, affordable, full-service coverage. Finally, you can live life knowing you have a lawyer in your back pocket who, at the same time, isn't emptying it. It's called Legal Shield, and it's practical, affordable, and a must for the family caregiver. Visit caregiverlegal.com. That's caregiverlegal.com. Isn't it about time someone started advocating for you? www.caregiverlegal.com, an independent associate. Welcome back to Hope for the Caregiver here on Family Talk Channel. This is Peter Rosenberger. This is the nation's number one show for you as a family caregiver. How are you holding up? How are you doing? How are you feeling? 877-655-6755. 877-655-6755. If you want to be a part of the show, that was my wife, Gracie, on, from her new record, Resilient. And she is indeed resilient. Uh, we're going to get back to our conversation. John and I are having a very philosophical discussion on this. And uh, calm down, the, Kierkegaard. It, All right, <laughs> calm down. Yes, that's philosophical. <laughs> such a strong word. But we're talking about some of the things going on in our country, and can the principles of caregivers navigate to safer ground? Will that help others as well in the country? And I think it will. And I, I was struggling with this as I was watching because I thought, hey, what do you say to this? And, and I don't know that it requires me to say anything, but I'm saying something to myself, I guess, at this point to kind of wrap my yeah. mind around it because I think it's it's so big, it's so awful, it's so horrendous. And okay, when things look big, awful, and horrendous, what's the first thing we need to do? And according to the the things I've learned over the years of being a caregiver for now 34 years. The first thing you do is slow down. Just like when you come to a fog of the road, you slow down. You just simply slow down. And do you feel like that as a country, as this thing was racing out of control, that that anybody was saying, slow down, John? I mean, Yeah, and, uh, and to kind of bring anybody up to speed who hasn't been around, we talk about the fog of caregivers and being lost in the fog because of the fear, obligation, and guilt. 
because you know you're clever with words and acronyms and things like that. So <laughs> well, um, I'm real witty, or at least yeah. halfway there. Uh, oh, I uh, like that thank, one. Thank you very little. Thank you very little. <laughs> oh no, you got all the little that you deserve. So all right. So, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, we talk about the the fog here and um, the the fog of caregivers is exactly yeah. it because as I was watching all this, I'm thinking, okay, what's the is there anything that that caregivers experience and learn that may be applicable here? Yeah, and and of course, vice versa. You know, we're interested in how. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's like we're always we're always can... wanting. But but here's here's the general problem for a caregiver, in in just a broad brush, we're dealing with a relentless, the relentless challenges of a chronic impairment. Okay, mm. now some of those I like where you're going. Well, uh, some of those may be really acute uh, and be dealing with when you're dealing with somebody who's an addict or an alcoholic. Those those are are wildly out of control behaviors. Right, right. And then you're dealing with people who have dementia, and that is a declining, circling, out of control behavior. Just relentless, yeah. But then you may be dealing with a special needs kid who deals with autism, where it can, there are certain structures that can be learned and modified to help. Indeed. And then you're dealing and, and with a physical rough disability. Improvement. Yeah, yeah. It can yeah, happen, yeah, rough but improvement. Like, yeah. But then you're dealing with a physical disability and and that can be accommodated with adaptive equipment. So there are different kinds of things, but regardless of which there are chronic impairments that create resi- uh, uh, relentless challenges. And this could go on for years. In my case, it's, we're in our fourth decade, or it could go, you know, for the lifetime. And, and it doesn't end at a grave for the caregiver, because I think the caregiver deals with the residual impact and imprint of this. So let's take that thought and then put it on what the nation's going through. I think it's very clear that our nation is chronically ill. We have a chronic impairment that is relentless in our nation, and it is fostering of the inflammation of rage and resentment and anger on multiple levels. And it's not just the disparity of a treatment by uh, police officers towards African-Americans. Then you've got the people now who are seeing the impairment of unleashed rage tearing apart businesses uh, that had nothing to do with this whatsoever. I mean, the cheesecake, I saw somebody, they were looting the cheesecake factory. To their the, credit, cheesecake... the cheesecake factory is amazing. Right? <laughs> well, yes, but it had absolutely nothing to do with any of this. It's just well, the cheesecake factory. And well, nothing if, if, says. If we want to get super philosophical about it, this is. And a, we do. A, and we do. Um, <laughs> it does have something to do with it. They're, they're the people who would, would you know, encourage that sort of action are saying that this is all part of the same deal. Burn and it all I, down. Yeah, burn it all down. And. and I might not agree, but I can. I could have a conversation with them about that. You know, if you like, not while they're stealing your cheesecake. Not while while they're stealing my cheesecake, but I could have a conversation about it. And that's, but that's not where we are right now. We're in the middle. Yeah, nobody's having a conversation. So what I was getting to is that if you said, you know, the nation has a chronic impairment, one of the first things you do is you diagnose that and you figure out what that impairment is. And I don't know if we've done that yet. No, I don't think we have, and and I think it's too easy to say, well, it's this, right? Because because the symptoms are what they are, but yeah, they're manifold. It's but weird. let's go back to the caregiver because that's what yeah, this yeah, show yeah. is about. All Indeed. right, so those of us who love this country and want to care for this country and be good stewards of this country, what is our responsibility? What is our part in this? What can we do? I don't have an enormous amount of faith in the political establishment bringing any type of viable solution. I don't think that's going to happen. I think that the American people will have to, as as individuals and as a collective, decide that they want to move in a different direction. Now, there will be stragglers along the way that won't go there. Yeah, and, and there's going to be people who are out front. Well, one of our favorite philosophers, Fred Rogers, <laughs> always look for the helpers. You know, there, there are people out there doing that. And, 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 
And so I, and I go back to this fog of caregivers. This is where it really goes off the rails for us as caregivers. When we're trying to do something to the best of our ability, we're usually running short on time. We're very, very pressed for time. It's getting ugly for us, and, and the tension is building up. The tension is building up, and all of a sudden we have a fog, and we somehow mistakenly think we can punch this thing, and we're just going to have to slow down. So I think the country yeah. is going to have to slow down. We've your got your to instinct is to turn on the high beams. Don't turn on your high beams. No. Slow down. Yeah. And follow outside help. So what does outside help said? That GPS, that grace, purpose, and stewardship. And you go back to stewardship. Are we being the best stewards, custodians, your word, of the freedom that we have? If you're a law enforcement officer, are you being a good steward of the authority you've been given? If you are a citizen, are you being a good steward of the responsibilities you have as a citizen of this country? And when you start changing the the the, con, the conversation a little bit by just those adding those words in, as a there political leader, are you being a good steward of the office that you hold? And that's because they really should be. When we talk about, you said, what what does a steward look like to you? Well, I didn't say politician because, <laughs> <laughs> although that's the ideal, I don't have a lot of faith that they've gotten close to that ideal. It was and designed to yeah. be that way. Yeah, that they were citizen legislature, and it exactly. was designed for that. But it's but it's become so much more. And then I go back to the first part of the GPS: grace, purpose, and stewardship. And this is something I live by myself as a caregiver of these things because I get lost in the fog on any given day at any given point. It's not fair. The fog is not fair. Okay, oh, yeah. it's just, it's just the fog. And so I get lost in it, so I go back to this grace, purpose, and stewardship. Okay, so what does grace look like this in this? And see, I married a woman named Grace. I think she has the most beautiful name in the entire English language. That is just, I, 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 I just love her name, Grace, and what it means. Unmerited favor. You don't have to earn it. It's given. And I thought, can we demonstrate and give grace to one another in this? To ourselves. Exactly. Can we give grace? Do you struggle really with that? Like where you're going I mean, with I'm, I'm putting you. I put you on the spot. Does that? Do you okay. struggle with giving grace to yourself? I do. I all the time. I uh, um, there are times when I'm really good at it, <laughs> and uh, then there's a you know, it's even something as simple as this is the joke uh, way of looking at it, but like ugh, lying awake at night thinking about that. You know, wait, wait, I, that I, sounds I, like an air supply song. Yeah. <laughs> Way to pull that one out of the archive. All right, like, careful with that joke. It's an antique. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh, that, you know, it, it, something is, it, it, and this is a silly thing, but like, ah, I said that, I said that really embarrassing thing in seventh grade and it's still stuck with me or something like that. But that, and then you can, it just gets magnified and, or the, the you know, the, uh, uh, the argument you have yourself with yourself in the shower that you lose. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I get that. Listen, can we continue this, John? I, I don't want to leave. Do so. All right, this is hope for the caregiver. This is Peter Rosenberger. Why am I asking you? It's my show. Yeah, eight seven seven. Hey, look, if you're enjoying the dialogue, even on Facebook Live, whatever, feel free to call in. Tell us your thoughts on it. Eight seven seven. 655-6755, 877-655-6755. We're not the arbiters of this. We just want to have the dialogue. Is there a better way to do this? Can we show better stewardship? I think we can. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Peter Rosenberger. Have you ever helped somebody walk for the first time? I've had that privilege many times through our organization, Standing with Hope. When my wife, Gracie, gave up both of her legs following this horrible wreck that she had as a teenager, and she tried to save them for years, and it, it just wouldn't work out, and finally she relinquished them and thought, wow, this is it. I mean, I don't have any legs anymore. What can God do with that? And then she had this vision for using prosthetic limbs as a means of sharing the gospel, to put legs on her fellow amputees, and that's what we've been doing now since 2005 with Standing With Hope. We work in the West African country of Ghana, and you can be a part of that through supplies, through supporting team members, through supporting the work that we're doing over there. You could designate a limb. There's all kinds of ways that you could be a part of giving the gift that keeps on walking at standingwithhope.com. Would you take a moment to go out to standingwithhope.com and see how you can give 
They go walking and leaping and praising God. You can be a part of that at standingwithhope.com. As a caregiver, think about all the legal documents you need. Power of attorney, a will, living wills, and so many more. Then think about such things as disputes about medical bills. What if, instead of shelling out hefty fees for a few days of legal help, you paid a monthly membership and got a law firm for life? Well, we're taking legal representation and making some revisions in the form of accessible, affordable, full-service coverage. Finally, you can live life knowing you have a lawyer in your back pocket who, at the same time, isn't emptying it. It's called Legal Shield, and it's practical, affordable, and a must for the family caregiver. Visit caregiverlegal.com. That's caregiverlegal.com. Isn't it about time someone started advocating for you? www.caregiverlegal.com, an independent associate. Have you ever struggled to trust God when lousy things happen to you? I'm Gracie Rosenberger, and in 1983, I experienced a horrific car accident leading to 80 surgeries and both legs amputated. I questioned why God allowed something so brutal to happen to me. But over time, my questions changed, and I discovered courage to trust God. That understanding, along with an appreciation for quality prosthetic limbs, led me to establish Standing with Hope. For more than a dozen years, we've been working with the government of Ghana and West Africa, equipping and training local workers to build and maintain quality prosthetic limbs for their own people. On a regular basis, we purchase and ship equipment and supplies, and with the help of inmates in a Tennessee prison, we also recycle parts from donated limbs. All of this is to point others to Christ, the source of my hope and strength. Please visit standingwithhope.com to learn more and participate in lifting others up. That's standingwithhope.com. I'm Gracie, and I am Standing With Hope. Welcome back to Hope for the Caregiver here on Family Talk Channel, Sirius XM 131. We're live. My name is Peter Rosenberger. I am the host of this show, and we are glad to have you here. That is my wife, Gracie, singing from her new record, Resilient. You can get a copy of that, hopeforthecaregiver.com, and just click on her CD cover, and you can help be a part of what we're doing at this show. Whatever amount you want to give, we'll send you a CD of it, and it's a tax-deductible gift to our organization, our ministry that we do. We started this a long time ago. We have two program areas. One is a prosthetic limb outreach, uh, standing with hope that Gracie envisioned after she gave up both of her legs and she wanted to be able to offer quality prosthetic help to her fellow amputees. We've been working in the country of uh, Ghana and over in West Africa and the Republic of Ghana for 15 years. And we send over supplies, we purchase supplies, and then we also go over there with teams. We were going to go there in August but I don't know that traveling overseas right now, John, is probably the uh, might, best call. <laughs> yeah, gonna, yeah, might be. We're going to hold off on that for just a little yeah. bit longer. But we're going to send. We we just bought some resin, um, and uh, anything that you want to do to help us continue that work. Uh, we also are sending over some funds to help with a little extra cost of some food for some of the patients and, and technicians we work with and so forth. Uh, you know, this thing is hitting everywhere, so we're able to do that. And if you want to help us do more of it, go to Standing with Hope uh, and take a look at it. Uh, it's 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 extraordinary work, and I think you'd be very very pleased with it. And then the other, of course, is this radio show and our outreach to the family caregivers. For it's for the wounded and those who care for them. Hope for the caregiver. Dot com. Oh oh, by the way, we recycle prosthetic legs. If yeah, you, that was I was, <laughs> was going to get to this. If you know I somebody was, uh, who uh, who has a uh, an amputee in their family. Please communicate this to them because we amputees go through a lot of legs. Gracie's gone through, I don't know how many of them in her 29 years as an amputee. Is there a centipede and, joke in here? No, there's no centipede okay. joke. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, don't bug me. <laughs> oh. uh, <laughs> Buzz off. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, no, you can recycle a prosthetic leg, uh, or at least components of it, not the whole thing. The socket is uniquely made to that person. That's why we purchase resin because that's used in the lamination process of making a brand new socket. But you can recycle the knees, the feet, the pylons, the connectors, the adapters, the screws, the prosthetic socks, the belts, the liners, the sleeves, if they're in good shape. 
and the shoes. But I'm just constantly amazed on how many people will sit <laughs> one leg with one shoe on it. I'm thinking we don't carry the other shoe here with it. Please sit both both shoes uh, because we will be glad to give shoes to somebody because there are a lot of people that don't have it. A lot of the amputees we treat wear sandals. Right. That are not necessarily good or flip flops, basically. Right, right. And that's not good for a prosthetic foot. So I can't I imagine had, why it wouldn't be. <laughs> well, I've had more patients come in that with their children. For example, we treat a lot of children and we bought them the first pair of shoes. There's a market across the street from the clinic. Oh. We would go over there. I would take a little foot, uh, one of the prosthetic feet we get because we get uh-huh. them all sizes, and I go over there and try to match it up with the right shoe. And usually we get lace up type sneakers or dress shoes and things that have a solid, you know, construction. To it. And, yeah, then, yeah. and that's the first pair of shoes that some of these children have ever owned. You know, I, and, we've been doing this show for seven years. You didn't right? know that? And I didn't know that. I didn't know. <laughs> that's a beautiful little story. That's it, is, wonderful. It, it is. There's nothing like going to an open air market in Ghana with a prosthetic leg to get a few when you're a white guy. And, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, Looking and like they, you with the preacher well, they, hair, they, you know. Well, they think of Bill Clinton over there, and, you know, <laughs> with my white hair. And uh, y'all just bring the car around. And um, so it's a. Uh, <laughs> But but I get a lot of stares, and they call me O'Brony, and they say, O'Brony, and they're oh. yelling out. And, and I have a good time. They're just delightful people. And, okay, and- so this is something that's been co- – this is completely off topic, but you know us. So I don't think you're going to – I think, <laughs> we, I, I think you'll allow this for a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but uh, recently, uh, even our, our president has tweeted something about this. Have you ever seen the pallbearers over there? The the over, Ghanaian Paul Bear. Oh yeah, we the, the, the funerals over there are something to behold. Yeah 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 I, I, we even talked about this. Like I'm just curious. You know, like <laughs> it's 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 yes, it is it is that's something that we could certainly talk about this at another time, John. Yeah right right. But, just, <laughs> but <laughs> back to the legs. <laughs> yeah, back um, to the legs. But but anyway, a, so, that, so I, you're, you're you're doing this in a wonderful, beautiful country with lots of interesting interesting things going on in it. there so. are interesting things that go on and and they're delightful people who uh we are pleased to serve in this capacity and if so if you know of somebody that has a prosthetic leg uh tell them don't throw away the things they outgrow or they discard we'll take them and we'll recycle them if you uh or know of somebody at a funeral home or something pass, uh, just pass the word on that you know family members can do this and help somebody else walk and uh, they go to a prison in Tennessee. Core Civic runs this prison. It's one of their many faith-based programs. And inmates volunteer to disassemble, which is a really wonderful program in itself, too. It's the only one in the country like this where inmates volunteer to participate in this one-of-a-kind program. So put the word out there. Uh, it's Standing helping with Hope. Helping them as well. You're yes, helping, because you feel like when you were you in prison, did you visit me? You know? But, you know, Jesus said five things. Sick, naked, hungry, prison, thirsty. And he's pretty serious about all five of those. And, uh, <laughs> seems but, like it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he seems to think so. Yeah. And, uh, but it's, um, you know, the, the inmates love the work. They, it's interesting work, and they get to see that it's making a real difference for people. And and, they're, it, it, and a lot of times the patients will send in a note with the family. I mean, the family member of that loved one that passed away, they'll send in a note telling their story. And we keep those notes. Mm. Those are very meaningful to us. So we take it very seriously. And uh, faith-based programs in prison work. If you don't, you know, if you want to learn more about that, go out to corecivic.com because they'll they'll show you all the different things they work. They work. It helps reduce the recidivism where, where people they don't want people coming back. You know, it's not a hotel. We don't want you to come back. We want yeah. you to go out and live a productive life, and that's a part of it. So um, standingwithhope.com. If you want to see more about that, standingwithhope.com. John, we're talking about the fog of caregivers. And we as are. we continue on this conversation, because I've been thinking as I watch the nation struggle with this, it's very easy to be on the sidelines. We caregivers understand that because there are a lot of people on the sidelines always telling us how to do it better. Exactly. And and I don't want to be that person in this situation. I can't tell the Minneapolis police, and the state trooper and the governor all that how to do it better. I can't tell the mayor of Nashville how to do it better when he did his thing yesterday yeah. and, and it went a little wonky there in Nashville. I can't tell the president how to do it better. I mean, I can, but what point does it have? Exactly. It's and, like, and it's you like you're yeah. taking care of a loved one with Alzheimer's and your family members or friends, whatever, want to sit there on the sidelines and judge you and tell you how well you're doing or not doing. Get some skin in the game, okay? You know? Yeah. The, you know, there's but, a... 
but but the but the question I have is: Are some of the principles that we as caregivers deal with on a regular basis are they helpful in a situation like this? And so I'm just you and I did not rehearse this. There was no plan. We, no, we are not coordinated in any way, fashion, or form. We don't no, have rehearsals. <laughs> but but I wanted to have this conversation. I have looked to John over these seven years that he has helped um, guide this show and produce it. Uh, I've looked to him as, as a tremendous sounding board to be able to just bounce things off of and throw it out there. And then he filters it through his butlerometer. And, <laughs> and whatever it is, he filters it through and 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 spins <laughs> spins it around. Look, so look, that we, we don't can need to talk it. about how the sausage is made. All right, <laughs> <laughs> probably best not to. Yeah. But you know, I I just thought about that. I thought, okay, what can what can we learn from this? It's, yeah, is is the, there something we can learn? Because clearly, we're not learning the lesson very well as a country. Well, the more we talk about this during the course of this hour, I I I think that. One of the one of the things that we can learn is, well, just uh, having having some empathy for and I see so much about uh, everyone has someone to blame in this. And we leap to that very, very often. We like to put blame on something or someone or some other thing. And blame is kind of a form of well, I mean, well, it's uh, taking your hands off somebody else's throat. You know, being forgiveness, and uh, but but I, you're I, talking I hope, about blame, yeah. but can't that goes back to our GPS model to get through the fog? Exactly, ship captains yeah. and airplane pilots and so forth. They use a GPS, an external orientation in time and space. So right. what's our GPS in dealing with this? And that first, that G stands for grace. Instead of blame, can we give grace? There you go. Uh, and grace is un merited favor. And as a believer, I can tell you that I'm often asking for mercy for myself and justice for everyone else. Mm. And and that is a bad place to be. <laughs> you yes. know? Let me just say it's that is not a healthy system. place. Yeah. But but I when you ask for mercy for yourself and justice for others, can we can we flip that a little bit and 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 uh, or at least shift the, the thinking and start saying, okay, what does mercy look like? What does grace look like in this situation? What does grace look like to the the the, the perpetrator of this thing that started this whole, the whole thing with George Floyd, the the, the, the police officer? That's good. that's a separate transaction. That's going to have to be dealt with in the course of law enforcement. But my thing is, what about grace for the Minneapolis Police Department? What about grace for those people that have to show up the next day and go to work in an environment well, where they know that the entire world now is looking at them and thinking, oh, my gosh, what kind of, you know, what about grace there? Well, and if you, if, if we are talking about the country in the context of having a chronic impairment, that's grace for everyone. That's that, grace that is, for, that is, that's, a, that's, that's grace. an extensive grace, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and and we can we can you know we can emphasize one group, three groups, five groups, whatever. But to try yeah, to yeah, we get out of the have, thing of saying they're this is bad, these are good. Right, right. Yeah, we, and yeah. Say, okay, that's not our job. That's not our job. Somebody yeah, else's we have, job. Yeah, we have <laughs> a, we have an impairment. You know, somebody with dementia. You don't come after them and say you're a bad person. You have an exactly. impairment. Yeah, and if, if you can do that to people who are engaging in property destruction or just peacefully protesting or are the police officers or whatever, but you give it, like there's it's going to be very it's going to be very difficult because giving grace often isn't nearly as loud as the opposite. No, it's not, is it? Yeah. And 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 grace doesn't mean that they're absolved of consequences of behavior. Oh, of course. E- and consequences themselves can be gr- an act of grace. Because it allows people to learn, it allows people to to have to deal with their own stuff, you know. Right, and and if you but, want to but, talk about uh, like reforming the or like uh, adjusting the way that we protest, or adjusting the way that the police interact with certain aspects of the community, or adjusting that, that's that's part of the deal. We're we're still trying to figure out how that is supposed to work out. Well, and and then you get there, there there's a lot of opportunity for grace and stewardship all the way up the food chain here. Yeah. Were officers put in situations where they were not confronted over their issues and they were not having to answer for behaviors long before it becomes this level of destruction? 
Right. And if so, what can we do to back that up and start putting in those kinds of places so there are warning flags? With caregivers, I can tell you there are always warning flags with caregivers. I call them the seven caregiver landmines. Mm. And one of those is we start gaining weight. I mean, we just do. So many caregivers start gaining weight. That is a warning sign that that, that caregiver is seeking to comfort something. Something is not balanced. Another one is the loss of identity. We start speaking in first person plural, third person singular. That's a warning sign. And so there's an because- interesting thing there uh, because I think one one of the things I look at with the with the uh, the sickness of the country that we're talking about is I uh, I feel like that a lot of this is people searching for identity. And that's one of the that's in all yeah. kinds of stuff, you know, whether like if, if, if you are a well, it doesn't matter. As soon as you make something political, you are kind of forcing people into you're locking somebody into uh, one side or the other. You know, like if it's if it's we're talking about one thing or, you know, and it, it, it removes the you're choice polarizing. From person. Yeah, yeah. It ends up being polarizing. And that's. We're running out of time, but that's that's where my brain was going no, on that one. No, that's and that's a good place to go because I think that this is what happens to us. And we said it has to be this way. Does it? Mm. You know, sometimes you can build a better mousetrap. And as a caregiver, I can tell you that sometimes as caregivers, we have to learn to build better mousetraps. We can't just keep doing it the same way. We're going to talk some more about this. This is Hope for the Caregiver. This is Peter Rosenberger. This is the show for you as a family caregiver. 877-655-6755. 877-655-6755. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Hope for the Caregiver here on Family Talk Channel. This is Peter Rosenberger. This is the nation's number one show for you as a family caregiver. 877-655-6755. I thank you, John, for taking the time to indulge me with this because I do think that the principles that we face when dealing with a chronic impairment as caregivers can be applied. And it takes a little bit of thinking and a little bit of um, elbow grease and, uh, and a lot of heart, a lot of heart. One, one you got to want to. I, yeah. Well, and, and this is uh, part of this is kind of fit into the theme for, you know, what what I try to do all the time, uh, which is I I'm probably not going to be right at the very beginning of the conversation. And we're often really married to the idea that we you know, I come into come into a thing and and um, oh, no, no, I've got the answer. I know that that Kevin Bacon was in Footloose, you know. And maybe you're wrong. So you look it up on Google or whatever, because you're more interested in being right at the end of the conversation. And and, and we here's the that. thing I've learning. You don't have to prove someone wrong in order for you to be right. Yeah. And, 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 and hopefully you have a lot of being proven wrong ahead of you because that means you've got a lot of growth ahead of you. But, but if, if you're, if your goal is to establish your rightness by proving that they're wrong, as opposed yeah. to collaborating and moving the conversation forward, you're in for some disappointment. It's just it's not Indeed. gonna it's not gonna have a happy ending for you. And it's I think just at, least, goal, at least it's counter it's not productive, you know. So. It is counterproductive, I think. And I think that it, it is it, and sometimes it can be destructive because then we become, like you said before we went to the break, being polarized. And I look at the country and the country is clearly very polarized. And, and so what do we do about it? And, and I, you can't look to Washington or any other political entity on down to fix this because Washington is polarized. You know, it's, it's the condition of the human heart. And, and so maybe it just starts with one weary heart connecting to another weary heart and saying, you know, enough's enough. And, and and to bring this back to the fog thing, um, this the the way we get through this is because well i feel like one of the causes of of the polarization is the fact that we are increasingly isolated and we don't have a lot of other voices 
from different walks or or different political persuasions or different whatever different experiences and if we can combat the isolation we can do a lot of work on the other thing because you can make it personal and you know if we if we want to do better go out, go out and make friends you know that's that's a good way well, to start when Maybe i was in ghana, when, when i was in ghana there's a castle on the coast of ghana at cape coast hmm. it's about three hours um east of accra up the coast beautiful castle and it's a museum now, and you can go and see, and they'll tour. And you go down below, and there's all the dungeons where they had the slaves that waited to be hauled out to mm. take to the ships to come to America and other places. And there were thousands and thousands and thousands that went through there. And at time, they would hold them in there, just slammed in there, uh, you know, hundreds at a time crammed into there with, with just filth, and and almost you know just hardly any sustenance and and no light. It gets worse. Above that, in the castle, there's a chapel. And they would conduct worship services in that chapel, but they would have the slaves be quiet down below so that people could worship undisturbed. Mm. And nobody, nobody saw that as a problem. Yeah. And and that is not the church. The church leaves the chapel and goes to the dungeon. And then the dungeon becomes the church. Because that's what our, our mission is, is to stop insulating ourselves in our own comfort and our own systems of of whatever makes us feel better. Better Christians, we make we feel better as better believers or whatever. Whatever it is that we're trying to do to make ourselves feel better, that's not the right goal. And that's we go not into you. Be better. No, it's not. And we go into places, and that's where the third part of this GPS comes in, the grace, purpose, and stewardship. Purpose. There's purpose. Now we have purpose to go into those those painful places, to be elbows deep into painful places. If we're not willing to do that, this will never end. This will never end. Somebody has to leave the comfort and go into the discomfort and and equip each other to be stronger through it. That's the only way this ends. And as caregivers, I can say that the goal is never to feel better. It cannot be. The goal is to be better, like you said, John, is to be better people. And that comes from learning to be healthier, not trying to be happy, trying to be healthy. Happiness will come. Healthiness is the goal. Healthy caregivers make better caregivers. This is Peter Rosenberger. This is Hope for the Caregiver. Hopeforthecaregiver.com. Check out our free podcast. It's all out there. Thank you for letting us be a part of here, the Serious Family. We're going to switch everything out to the podcast from here on out, so I hope you'll check it out. Hopeforthecaregiver.com.